Welcome back to another week of shows. Uh, today is I'm doing Shore Four Sisters, and because it's our Shore film, which I remember last time I did Shore, that was the only one I did that week. I did it only later on. This week, remember something similar. I'm going to do two, two more videos this week as well. So a short, quick videos too. They won't be in depth for anything uh, because Shore is kind of a difficult watch so it took me a while to watch it it's exhausting he's kind of bored doing a ton of videos after seeing a show or film <laughs> it's just like it's always the same because it's so kind of, so devastating so um this is gonna be a light week for videos just just a warning straight away and even the other videos i'm doing this week are not like heavyweight videos in any way these are the videos i would maybe do maybe not do but because I'm on a light week here, I thought I'd do them because they're quite interesting subjects. But they're not going to be like massive in depth stuff like press or movie or something, they're just like small like documentary things. Right, uh, so showing the Four Sisters, this has just been released uh, by the Masters of Cinema and it's the last film, set of films Landsman did before he died. These are the last interviews he did. He did these interviews but didn't make sure. And he's also made other did interviews but he did like cask report and last down just which I've also done a video on which is available elsewhere on my channel. Um so I've done I, I've done all the landsman films as videos now. But that, we made this just before he died, so this is the last of them probably. Unless there's other outtakes that have been shown that someone else may do, I don't know. But these are the last ones he personally was in charge of personally put together and these ones are literally um, just the dog head interviews you get some images for context but not many I mean the meat of the thing is interviews most interviews last about an hour long or ten minutes the first one lasts an hour and a half that's the longest one but this gets so much more in it <laughs> there's so much in it that this is, it had to be that long, but the rest of them are about an hour long each. So uh, there are, so basically four women who survived the Holocaust, four Jewish women who survived the Holocaust in very different ways. They did, they, no story mirrors any of the others. Every story has its, you know, has its areas that are very unique to themselves. So they, they're called the Hippocratic Oath, the Mary Flea, Baluti, and Noah's Ark. Um, I would say the hardest one to sit through is actually the first one, the Hippocratic Oath, because that is pretty devastating. The woman of that one, Raphael Elias, she um, wrote a book about her experience as well, which you can get on Amazon. So it's a. Uh, there is more to her story. The other stories are less. I've only an hour long. I the people who, who were in them. Never did anything else about it, they just did interviews and that was it and that's all they managed to do. So, so it being broken down as one is about a woman who went through the ghetto and through Auschwitz, the first one with Elias. Then there's the Mary Flea, which is about a woman who survived Sobibor before the escape. All about experiences up to the escape in Sobibor. The next one, Baluti, which is about life in the ghetto essentially, and a woman who so, who was survived uh, and uh, ended up being a police person to get for a while and how that affected her and survived in Auschwitz and all the rest of it. She didn't know but survived it. And the final one is Noah's Ark, which is about a woman who came from the higher level of... She was Hungarian and they were like... She was a Hungarian Jew and the Hungarians worked with the Nazis for a long time and the Jews, they had never... It didn't get as bad as the Polish Jews and she was one of the higher class people, she was one of the richer people with the connections so it's four, four stories of different people with different social levels and one thing this film is all about is so, how social levels affected survival in um, the Holocaust. I mean, I mean if you're a rich I can guarantee you're going to survive but it gave you a bit more of a chance. It also gave you a bit more of a chance if you were in the ghetto to survive a bit better because you had some money and you were, you know, there were, 
even within the poor and within the worst, there's those levels and those corruption and this is human nature at its base level. So the first one, Hippocratic Oath, was um, Ruth Elias. Hers is like a devastating story because uh, yeah, it starts off, she's just a young girl, she's a young woman who's just um, just leaving her teenage years when the uh, occupation began. She ended up going to the ghetto and during that time she gets married because uh, she, in the ghetto, she finds a person who was a boyfriend so at that point they get married to make it easier for themselves to stay together and it just seemed to be something she wanted to do but in the ghetto um, men and women weren't allowed to um, be together even if they're married so even though they were married they could barely see each other they didn't want any babies born or anything like that and then throughout uh, that period she talks about how she survived a ghetto, like how she went to the kitchens and where the people there would actually steal food just to eat so they could eat properly because it was such a horrible experience because the whole thing was just, brutal just brutality. Just people were getting starved to death, the Germans didn't care, it was just the, the way things were. And she was just talking about how the, the close call she had throughout the war. And she had lots of close calls. I mean, um, she was the only survivor of her family. All the rest of her family died. And during the ghetto experience, she finally managed to move with her husband at a certain point to a place. And she ended up getting pregnant. Um, then the ghetto was cleared and she had to go to Auschwitz. And she was pregnant. She had to hide how she was pregnant. Otherwise, she thought she would get gas straight away. So she would hide she was pregnant and worked there and then there was another workforce away from Auschwitz which she managed to con her way on to instead of trying to hide the fact that she's pregnant there as well until she thinks she get caught and that's when the story really gets terrific um, because after they discover she's pregnant the Nazis want to see how long a want to experiment, they want to, she gives birth to the baby and they decide to wait and see how long a baby can survive without food as an experiment. I mean, that's horrific. That's like, that's just one of the worst things I've ever heard in my life. That's just so horrible. Of course the baby didn't survive. No matter what she tries to do to save a baby, she doesn't survive. Eventually she survives Auschwitz and, and you know, the Allies liberate Auschwitz, so she survives, but she's... It's pretty devastating. The whole thing of going through the camps, then having to deal with a pregnancy in the middle of hell, and how that affects your survival chances, plus trying to care for a potential baby when you're barely feed, able to feed yourself. You know, and just for the cruelty of the Nazis, it's just like, it's just horrific. It's a horrific story. But hearing it from her point of view, you know, talk about it, her talking about the. Um, social interactions in the ghetto, but how she, how she had to be very careful, and how she had to try and survive through kind of other people helping her to survive and hide her pregnancy so she wouldn't be gassed. I mean, it's a really horrific story. And there's lots of like really close calls she describes that you can't believe uh, these things happened. It's, it's just a stunner. You really need to see it um, in her words exactly what happened because it's astonishing. I mean, I've only given you the brief, basic outline of the story. All the details she gives is amazing. It's just like so hot. The next one is the Mary Flea. The Mary Flea refers to the um, the place in Soviet War where the Germans got together and hung out and relaxed after a day of mass extermination. And they called it the Mary Flea and it was sub she was basically a Jewish woman who had to go there and clean out the Mary Flea when she arrived in Sobibor and then she had to try and survive. She was the one of the few survivors of her whole um, train that got there because she had some skills which they thought they could use. So she survived and she met her husband there as well in Sobibor. And she was just talking about how to survive Sobibor, how to 
deal with a commandant that was camp commander commandant who was just crazy and who could change his point of view at a whim but who's also like recognised as a human because he wanted to he asked for advice dealing with stuff for his wife and things at the same time he was <clears throat> helping mass kill thousands per day I mean it's just this horrific thing that goes on that's just an astonishing story and just does not describe the fact that the the, the, the the toys of the children who came to Sobibor were taken by the Germans and they would get the people, they get the Jews who were still there who had been gas to actually make new clothes for the dolls so that the Germans could take them home and visit their family and give to their children. So these were dolls of people who had been killed and they were taking the dolls and they wanted to uh, give to their children. I mean, you couldn't make this up, this is horrific. And it's just again all those details, all the details about um, going to the camp, how to survive the camp, how to just deal with life. It's just the horror stories of just someone talking calmly about their experiences and how they survived and how they dealt with something that's indefensible. So that's, that's, another, that's another horrific story. The next one, Baluti, which is a uh, story about a woman who ends up, she ended up moving to America, she couldn't stand being in Europe anymore after this experiences. She was in a ghetto for a long time, she was, um, her family was rich and she could actually pass for someone who wasn't Jewish because she, she didn't have very Jewish looks, but she still ended up in a ghetto, um, still ended up in Auschwitz, but again she survived Auschwitz. But for most of the time it's talking about her life in the ghetto because she was like one of the young people, young Jews who were still taught they went to uh, create a little farm in the ghetto to learn how to produce food because they were a lot of Zionists who wanted to plan for the future even though they didn't seem to have a future so teach the child how to farm and things like that and she was one of the generation one of the people of age who were interested in that so they get fed a bit more than normal they were like the the Jewish children who actually were avoiding getting sent to death camp because they were doing this, you know. And eventually once she graduated from that, she had to end up going to a factory to make Nazi uniforms. And then she found a way out of that and ended up being the police force of the ghetto, which was a horrific experience because whoever they arrested for any little infraction, they were the next train to, uh, to the ghetto. Not to the ghetto, to the Auschwitz. So, I mean... If you did your job at all, it was a death sentence for someone else. And her and some other people couldn't love it. And she's describing how some people, like the, everyone was in a compartment almost, almost where basically you didn't think of the emotions of what was going on. You just didn't do your job and not think of the consequences. And this is something people who, who were in that police force, none of them can talk about it because just the guilt and the horrors of what they faced. And they just can't deal with it because they feel so guilty what they did. And she's the only one who actually felt she should talk about it and what actually happened. And then eventually the police was closed down and eventually the ghetto was liquidated and she had to go to Auschwitz and survive there. But it's a very detailed story about mainly about life in the Jewish ghetto and what were the consequences of people's actions there and how people could be sent quite easily to... Uh, to their death because they weren't in the higher class or they weren't friendly with people in the Jewish um, society who had some power. If you were rich or if you had connections you'd last a lot longer. If you didn't, you were up shit creek basically and you were, you were one of the first trains out there. If you, and if you annoyed someone who was powerful, you are the next train out. It was just like brutality, horrible uh, survival techniques and we just that's just the way it worked and she was just talking about the whole thing and the, the details of it all was really fascinating so that's another great uh, story to listen to and see humanity you know how complicated humanity is even when it's back against the wall it's not just all you know everyone behaved perfectly no there were just people and some people were good and some were horrible the final one is Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark is um, about a woman from Hungary, Hungary Jew, a Hungarian Jew 
who survived the war, a lot of it because where she lived, Hungary was a an ally of the Nazis, so she was a Jew there. They were they were left till last before they were like, brutally put in ghettos and sent to Auschwitz. They were almost at the end of the war before that happened. But even then, before that, they lost all their rights. They couldn't be educated. Her husband took notes the whole way through and had a lot of connections. But the interesting thing is this film starts from starts with two people who didn't have any connections and it goes to two people who did have connections. It shows the, the social classes as they moved along. And she, her husband had connections, but even then he ended up spending two years on the Russian front being a worker for the German and Hungarian army. No, obviously no weapons, and most, there was like tens of thousands that went there from Hungary, of Jews that went there, and only like 3,000 Jews survived. It was a mass devastation by, you know, hunger, of disease. Most of them didn't survive. Her husband survived, but barely. I mean, she tells some of the stories about how even in the front, the Germans and the Jews would actually be sleeping together in small beds just to try and keep warm. So it wasn't quite what you'd think even there, it was a much more complicated situation. And then, after that, when the Jewish ghetto started in Hungary, how her husband was really connected to certain people who made a deal, I think it was Heinrich, uh, or someone, one of the big Nazis, Eichmann, and to get certain people away who were going to go to Israel. They ended up in Switzerland. But because her husband had connections, he got on that list and he got her, and he told her she had to come with him to survive. So they end up being on the list and then she talked about how the politics of getting on that list was complicated. People who had survived Russia, a lot of them had connections to get on the list as well. And it was just like, it was fairly, it was just survival instinct. Anyone anyway, who did not make the list died in Auschwitz, very much. If you didn't get on the list, you were dead. And how did some experiences getting from there to um, Switzerland and then, survive, then just the survival guilt of surviving the war, knowing what's happened to everybody and how they could never go back, you know, to where, they, where they've, they'd been before because they, cause Europe wouldn't longer go home for them. That's a big thing throughout this whole, all four of them, is like none of them could trust Europe after that. They, they all had to get out. One went to America. Most went to uh, Israel. Most of like became Zionists because it was like they wanted a home, they did not want to be in but other communities could actually just turn on them again. It was just like it was it was enough. I mean pol the poles in this get uh, called, you know, a lot of horrible things, <laughs> you know. It's pretty much shown the poles were not very good to um the Jews. They were some of them behaved horribly. But it's a wonderful series, series of um, interviews. It's really an interview and just letting people talk and that's the power of it. It's just experiences you can never make up. It was just it's horrific moments in time. But it's, it's great that the Eureka has actually managed to put this out in Britain. I mean, I think they sh should be commended for that. I mean, this is a wonderful film, a wonderful series of films that will haunt you. They're easier to take than Shore because Shore is 10 hours long, this one's like four and a half. You can watch it in little bits because it's four hours of interviews. I mean, I just saw them individually. Because I, I really couldn't take watch them all together, that would be too much. But they're really fascinating. I would urge you to try and see them. I would suggest you try and see them after you've seen Shore and after you've seen Last of the Unjust and some of those other documentaries. Because each one builds for the last one and becomes a full of experience if you've seen the other ones. I think you won't get the gravity of this if you haven't seen Shore. You'll get the gravity but you won't get the full details of how everything interlinks and... Because Land's been through the whole tapestry of life throughout all these documentaries. It's not just all about the Nazis, but it's also about the cost of the Jews who survived this horrific experience. The human cost of it and it, it, goes, it becomes more and more weighty the more he does, the more little documentary does after Shore to give you all these important details. So I definitely watch, I don't want to say more about it because I think it's important you see it for yourself. Because there's lots of details I have not talked about that are horrific. 
I've given you the, the rough guide to it, but I haven't given you the, the real like nasty, horrible things that happen. There's some really horrible things that happen. I'm describing this. So I, I don't even enjoy this, but I hope this caught your interest. And I hope that um, you'll go out and buy this, because I really recommend buying this. This is an important film, an important series of films. Really, it's a, it's an important end to an important career. And just go buy it. Or back to me for something else and I'll see you then.